Okay, we're going to start now. Welcome, everybody. I don't think I really have to introduce you, Fabian, because I think everybody in this room knows him already. But something that you might not know yet is that now Fabian is a freelance software engineer and uh, is also the former, uh, the founder and the lead developer at uh, Felding DSP Ltd. And uh, over the last years, among all these contributions to the Juice-based code, he did a, a lot of work of redesign and improvement in the plugin audio format backends, and it's going to uh, talk about this uh, right now for you guys. That was a very nice introduction. Um, so uh, my talk will be about looking under the hood of all of these uh, plugin formats. And recently, I was at a big C++ conference in the US at CppCon. And at CppCon, it's not like ADC, right? Like CppCon, there are many, many brilliant speakers. And some of these speakers, they're actually professional speakers, OK? So they're not like you and me. Like, we're, we're basically paid to not speak in code. And there, you've got like speakers who are paid to just speak about C++. So I learned a whole lot there, right? Like, one of the things I learned straight out of the box is to call myself a consultant and freelancer, right? Because on my slides there, I always said I'm a, I'm a contractor. But when people read contractor, they kind of um, look like are failed. Oh, no. Let me tell oh, that already. Probably there. So that's what people think when they uh, hear contractor, is someone who will fix your sink. I will not fix your sink, I'm afraid. Second thing I learned is that talks should be really interactive, OK? So at these talks at CppCon, they were always asking the audience questions. So that's when I prepared my talk. I was like, yes, I'm going to ask all you know, audience tons of questions, and they're going to put their hands up and everything. The problem was, like, two days ago, I was like, well, I kind of prepared the talk assuming that you would answer a certain way. And that's really bad, right? Because you'll probably, like, I expect you to be all Juice users, but then you're not. But then I realized that probably more people will watch on YouTube, and the people on YouTube won't see your answers. So if I just pretend you answer the way you're supposed to answer, then no one will ever be the wiser. So that's what I'm going to do here. So this is probably the first talk in your life that has terms and conditions, you know, like GDPR, where you just have to agree to the terms and conditions by visiting the site. Well, you're agreeing to my terms and conditions of this talk by just sitting here. And the terms and conditions of this talk is please ask questions at any time. Don't wait until the end. Um, also, all the code in here is really just for illustrations purposes. It's not the actual code, how they are in the plugin backend. There are probably mistakes in there. I just like hacked it all together. I didn't, I didn't really try compiling it. I also gloss over many of the details. I sometimes add footnotes where I'm like, OK, it, like, you know, if you really look at this, it's kind of wrong what I wrote there. Like, there's some you know, minor subtle issue. And then. I don't know, do we have Ivan from Steinberg in this room? Yes, there he is, right? Do we have Doug from Apple here or other audio unit creators who work on audio units? Yeah, they are in the back, okay? Do we have someone from, from AAX, from, from Avid here who worked on AAX? No, oh, okay. So um, the experts who made the plugins are in the room, right? So they know so much more, I mean, obviously, tons more about what I'm talking about. And, I'm, and also, please, if I say something wrong, just shout out. I, I, I really mean that. Like, I'm going to talk about the history. Like, some of these plugins, I have no idea what the history actually is. I tried to do my best researching it, but um, so just, just shout out and say, no, 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 that's wrong. It was actually like this. Um, and then, um, well, you'll see uh, during the talk, after the end of the talk, I'll probably be sued and be in a lawsuit, but uh, we'll get to that. OK, so ha who here uh, is a Juice user? OK, good, good, yeah. So that was half the room YouTube. Um, and who of you has like looked at the plugin wrapper code in Juice? OK, and I mean, from the other people who, like the, who have used, like, let's say, VST3 SDK, who has like, looked inside the guts of the VST3 SDK? Yeah, OK. So, most of you have, right? And this is what you kind of see, at least. That's, that's when, when I first looked at it, right? It's, it's 
lines of code and lines of code, and you have like I unknown a class there, and you have UUIDs and and you know, I don't know, I mean ref counting, and then some Windows return codes. This is the, the VST3 SDK. It's it's 70,000 lines of code, right? So I mean, what is going on there? Why so much code for a plugin format? I mean. Who has ever written a class, I mean, this is, of course, simplified, but who has in their plugin or in their audio code wrote a class similar to this, like some kind of processor? Yeah, okay, so 75%, right? So we've all written processors before. What's so hard about that, right? Like, I mean, we, we're all able to abstract this plugin concept away. Okay, so let's make it a bit more flexible. We want kind of maybe in your, in your audio app, you want to let the user choose exactly which processor to use. So you might want to add some metadata to the plugin, right? So you have a class called plugin. It can create a new processor on the fly. Uh, but here, important, in the constructor, in the base constructor of this plugin, we're going to add all the plugins that we find to a list so that you can show that in that combo box, okay? So this is how maybe your code looks like in your audio app. You have a ton of global variables here, low pass, high pass, reverb, gain plugin, and each of these plugins uh, calls the base constructor, and that will register it with that array. And then somewhere else, maybe in your code, you have the code that creates that little pop-up menu, that combo box, and it will just look at the array and add all of these filters to the combo box. And then when the user selects one, well, you just you know, look at the array and add the processor to the track. So, right, you've kind of already developed a plugin format, right? So everything is fast, everything is smooth. So, I mean, who has written like a bit, a bit more dynamic processor in their app? Probably not so many. One, two, three, right, yeah. Um, but it's not much to it, right? If you've written that processor class, you could do something like this, right? Um, great, so I mean, we've done this, right? We put this in the host, so let's, you know, let's just, Right now, it, these are not plugins you could load. Like, these are not plugins you could download. Everything's in the host, right? So, I mean, but it's simple, right? Let's just, let's just move some of this code into a DLL, right? All right, and like, the, like let's say the low pass filter, the implementation of the low pass filter and this global variable, let's just move that into a DLL, keep that code in the host. Hey, we got a plugin format, right? Everything's great, yeah. Right, it was easy, well, why, why 70,000 lines of code, right? And I just want to emphasize here, all we're doing here, this is working perfectly, and it would work perfectly, and all we're doing here is moving code into a DLL, right? Can't be that hard, right? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> well, um, you do that, and all of a sudden your audio starts crackling, and it starts crackling horribly, okay? And the reason is, well, you have here a sample by sample processing in your, in your DLL, and the compiler can no longer inline that process sample. It can no longer devirtualize this method call here, it can no longer inline this loop, because this is now in a different translation. It's in a, a completely different binary. There's no way for the compiler and the host to somehow inline a plugin that it doesn't even know about yet. So the performance will just tank. I mean, it will tank so much that it will not be even possible to use, right? So um, that's bad. So we have a nice little chart of the things that can go wrong, and we'll put a tick box here. Well, performance, yeah? Performance will tank if you do that, if you just put things in a DLL. Okay, we're not stupid, right? Easy to fix. We do block-based processing. Fine, everything's great. Um, performance is up again. But hey, uh, you just broke your backward compatibility, right? All your old plugins had that sample by sample processing. Now all of a sudden you switch to one of your methods, so everything just breaks again, and that's because we have a mismatch here, right? Process block, process sample, that's fine if you're just compiling your host. You get a compiler error, oh, you remember that you have to fix this, everything's great, but once you put this in a DLL, well, it, it probably just crash, right? So we have to watch out for backward and forward compatibility if you put code into a DLL. Okay, so um, we have this process block now, and there's actually another mistake we did here because uh, we had these set parameter and get parameter. Well, the set parameter and get parameter, we could just interleave uh, while we were doing sample by sample processing, but now we have process block, so we have no more sample accurate processing. That's gone, so let's put a tick under parameters. We lost sample accurate. Uh, parameters, um, then let's look at this nice little low-pass uh, processor 
uh, you know, it's calculating a bunch of coefficients every time the parameter changes, and that was maybe fine in your host because you always called set parameter on the audio thread. So the audio thread and your process block was never running at the same time. But now another host comes along and decides, hey, I'll just call this on the UI thread. And well, boom, explosion, because you know, imagine you only updated these two on the UI thread. Now your audio thread kicks in. Now it's basically updated these two coefficients, not these coefficients yet. And you know, especially with IAR filters, if the coefficients uh, are not consistent, uh, you'll probably get horrible loopbacks, and if you have earphones on, your, your ears might explode. So uh, that, that's, that's very bad. So um, maybe you know, a solution would be, let's call this change on the audio thread. Let's like, if this comes on the UI thread, let's just defer uh, the calculation and actually do the calculation on the audio thread. Now this leads to something that's really, really horrible. Imagine you have some automation data, right? You know, like you have this line here, it's changing the parameter. So you get a set parameter request, right? You send it, it's like, hey, 0 0.6. But the set parameter doesn't want to do it right now. It puts it into a queue, okay? In the meantime, though, before the queue actually gets to run, the, the, the parameter changes again, right? You get a call to set parameter 0 0.61. Now your queue kicks in, it sets it back to 0 0.6, it notifies that to the host, the host is like, hey, no, I don't want 0 0.6, now I actually want 0 0.62, and the whole loop starts going over and over and over again, and you enter what I call the parameter update spiral of death. <laughs> now, who has ever run into that problem? Yeah, okay, it's, it's a really difficult problem, and um, I mean, in Juice, we, run, we ran into it uh, all the time, and you know what's really, really cool about the parameter update spiral of death is that there's so many ways to enter that spiral, right? <laughs> it's like conversion to from text, there's some like rounding errors that you can have, uh, discrete parameters, right? There's like a bug where discrete parameters can only be one, two, three. Now, for some reason in the project, it's stored as 2.3, right? So the host wants it to be 2.3, you say no, but it's two, but then the automation is like in locked mode, so the automation really wants it to be 2.3, so it just bounces back and forth, right? 2.3, two, no, 2.3, two, and you go into the uh, spiral of death. And then parameter dependencies as well, it's like one parameter changes the value of another parameter, you get that very, very easily. So uh, yeah, that's what we just did, right? So let's give it another tick here, because we just entered the parameter spiral of death. Okay, so, we kind of fixed that somehow, and we're really happy we fixed all these bugs, and it doesn't even build on Windows. And the reason it doesn't build on Windows is because um, it's fine for the host to have symbol dependencies on the plugin, right? And like, there, there's some dependencies that need to be called into the plugin, but on Windows, and actually on Mac, if you compile it as a bundle, there can't be any dependencies going the other way, and this calls the constructor of our base class, right? And the, the constructor of our base class lives in the host, so, here we have now a dependency going the other way that's not allowed on Windows and in certain configurations on Mac, um, so it doesn't even compile. So again, some portability issues, okay? So what do we do? We create an entry point. This guy calls the entry point. Uh, that just returns a new instance of itself, and that, now the host can just add that to its own array, so that, that would fix it. Okay, great, we've kind of solved all the problems. Let's <laughs> ship it, right? Perfect, <laughs> great. Um, so then you decide there's a new Xcode version, why don't I update? So you update your host, and well, boom, right? Of course. So what just happened? Um, when you updated Xcode, well, uh, you, you were using std string as the plugin name, right? But when you updated Xcode, it actually updated your C++ version, and so the C++ standard library now has a different internal representation of strings. So when you try to do this, um, you know, the way a string is stored in your host is now different than in your plugin, and so you'll most likely get crashes. So uh, portability, let's give that another mark. And the thing to do is, is to only use uh, plain old data types, like don't use any complex types. Uh, it's a bit more comp complicated, but that's sort of the thing you need to watch out for. You can't use any, you know, any uh, strings, but no vectors, no maps, right? So you have to somehow write your interface in a way that you don't have any vectors and you don't have any maps and any, any other more complex STL types. 
but boom, it still actually explodes because when we allocated this here in the plugin, we're deallocating it in the host, and that's a big, big, big no-no because when we updated that C++ version, we actually, you know, the allocator change may have changed the way, you know, the way the allocator works, and that's something you may, must never ever do is to allocate in, in, in a DLL and to deallocate what you allocate in the DLL in the host. So that won't work, right? So let's add, add some, let's add two for those two last slides. So let's ship it again, right? We fixed all of that, great. But then like one of your plugin developers is like, hey, I heard compiler X is so much faster than compiler Y, so let's, let's build our plugin with compiler X because it's so much better, like let's say the Intel compiler versus, um, I don't know, Visual Studio. Well, <laughs> now you're really entering a world of pain. This is really, really difficult to get right, okay? And the reason is, that we, we're, like at our interface layer, we have this big um, class which has these virtual methods. Turns out the ordering of these virtual methods is not portable. So GCC and Clang, they always order them as they appear in the code. Uh, Intel orders them as they appear in the code, but they put the destructors and the operators first. And MSVC does something really strange. It does the same as Intel, but it also adds another virtual destructor in there that you didn't write just to deallocate the memory, okay? so. You know, imagine your plugin was built with Clang and your host was uh, written with Visual Studio. Well, it would just crash immediately. Um, so, and, but it gets worse, okay? Because even if we get rid of the classes and we just have freestanding functions, sorry, not portable either. Uh, the calling conventions of functions in C++ and the way the symbols are mangled in C++ is not portable either. And we're gonna talk a bit how, how to get around that. Yeah, but basically you can't use C++ which is kind of bad. So uh, let's add another two for portability just there. Okay, so all I did, as you see in the beginning, all I did was try to move code from the host into a plugin. We didn't do anything fancy yet, and all of these problems, okay? And there's so much more, right? I mean, there's different host versions. I was talking about like different plugin versions built with different things, but you know, imagine the hosts now have different, you know, built, are built with different things and different features and bugs. I didn't even talk about MIDI, right? So, so, so much legacy there. Sandboxing plugins, you know, one a plugin crashes, do you want it to take down everything else? Um, channel layouts and buses, something else I didn't even touch on. UI, you know, huge section. So there's so, so much more to get right, and uh, we have some of the plugin uh, developers here in this room, and I would just like to give them a huge uh, a round of applause for, for, for really maintaining this and, and working on this. Uh, it's, it's really hard to get right. Okay, so let's go to the first one. Let's go to VST, VST2 specifically, just so we know what we're talking about. VST1 was released when there were laptops looked like this, right? This was 1996. Um, from what Ivan uh, said in his talk last year, I gave a, a fantastic talk about uh, VST last year and some of the history. I was surprised to hear that they, it was really a close call to, to actually make VST public. So they, they weren't sure if they're going to make VST public or not, and uh, luckily they did. Uh, VST2 uh, was released when, when these things were around. Uh, Apple Power Macintosh Performer. So when you write VST plugins, uh, you basically need to implement these virtual methods. I mean, there, there are many, many more, but like these are the most important ones. You have a process replacing, set parameter, get parameter, you know, some open close methods, sample rate and block size. Who has written VST2s like directly not using juice, but actually just using, okay, that's about a third of the room, okay? So this is what you need to implement, right? But didn't I just say that we can't have any C++ in the interface layer? And that's still true. You can't have any C++ in the interface layer. So what, VS, what the VST2 SDK does for you, you need to include a VST uh, uh, CPP file in your plugin. And in that, there is a main entry point, which you see here is mark X turn C, because we're not allowed to use C++ freestanding functions. We have to mark this as a C function. You need to tell it which calling convention it uses. That gets called by the host. The plugin passes back a struct with uh, some fields like the number of channels, but also like this little magic field. But probably the most important one is a function pointer to a dispatcher function. 
this dispatcher function looks like this, and it takes an opcode here, and the, the implementation of the dispatch function is like this. It's a huge switch statement with all the things that the plugin can do. And these are opcodes, these are just numbers, right? So effect open has, I think, number zero, and effect close is number one, and it goes down like this. And then um, all of these opcodes, they will then invoke the method that you wrote, right? But this code, every person who has written a VST2 and was using the VST2 SDK has this code in their plugin that was provided to you by Steinberg. So um, I like to have this little picture, right? So this is the interface, here's your host, here's your plugin, and there's not much that can go through that interface, right? You can basically, only little C functions and opcodes can pass through that hole. Uh, but you don't want to be writing your plugin in just uh, you know, in a big switch statement with opcodes. So what you do is you include this audio effect CPP in your plugin, and then you can write with nice C++ features and you can derive from that class. <coughs> and uh, you know, luckily that dispatcher function was written, to, was written um, for you by Steinberg. But this funnel is also on the other side, right? So on the other side, the host right, ha was probably using some fancy C++ too and now has to translate everything into opcodes. So uh, I like to call this like the funnel of portability. You, you know, this portability hole is really, really small. So if you want to use any advanced features, you sort of have to funnel everything through that hole there. Now, uh, that would kind of kill performance, though. So some functions are passed as pointers through, like uh, uh, function points, through like the really critical methods. So after this dispatcher function pointer, you also have a process set parameter and get parameter um, function pointer. And we don't have sample by sample processing, I already said that. Um, VST2 works that the host just gives you a bunch of buffers with the input audio and uh, the output buffers that you, you're supposed to fill, and the plugin you know, just does its stuff and copies the output to the output buffers. The parameter system in VST2 works like this, that the plugin just reports the number of parameters it has, and then the host will call set parameter and get parameter with the index of the parameter that it wants. And if the plugin by its own means somehow changes the parameter, you tell the host that you've changed the parameter with a callback in the other direction. Um, this has one really uh, important limitation. By using indexes as, uh, to refer to your parameters, you run into this problem. Imagine you wrote a plugin that has a tuning volume and reverb volume, and you know, your customers created some automation data with that plugin. Everything's great. But in the, uh, in the plugin, the parameter indices are stored somehow in the DAW project. They're saved in, in, into your project. Now, uh, later, though, you decide to add like a major tuning uh, parameter, right? And it kind of fits the tuning. It should really you know, be presented above the tuning parameter. So now this all of a sudden has index zero. Now, if, uh, if your customer loads an old project, then obviously the indexes are all wrong and all the parameters will, will not work anymore, right? When, when something here was changing index zero, was actually trying to change the, the scent tuning, now it changes the major tuning. And when something was trying to change the volume, it's now changing the scent tuning. I mean, you get the picture. Okay. So uh, parameter system in VST2, it's a super simple API. Parameters can have names and labels. They can even have uh, custom textual representations of their parameter values. The bad is there's really only one single parameter type, which is continuous. It always goes from zero to one, and you refer to parameters by their indexes. Um, the ugly really uh, is there's not a really good definition of who is allowed to call set parameter and get parameter and when. So they can kind of arrive on any thread. It's kind of up to you to, like, to, to, to know what to do. There's, it's not really mentioned in the spec. Um, Parameter changes are not somehow time-stamped or anything, and uh, yeah, only a single type of continuous parameters. So these are all nice little invitation tickets to that spiral of death we saw earlier. Uh, future proofing. So you know, what if you want to extend the VST2 uh, um, uh, spec? Well, there's this like can-do infrastructure. So basically, the host can ask the plugin, "Can you do?" and then you supply it some kind of string. And the plugin can say yes or no, and then, then, you can, then you can use that method, and the other way around works well, as well. The plugin can ask the host, like, can you do this? And the host can respond with yes or no. It's kind of like a little dance that you can do to, to, uh, to extend um, the features of, of VST2. 
There's some other limitations uh, more on this, like it's not that clear in VST2 what, what stuff arrives on which threads. It's just not baked into the standard. Uh, one thing that's super annoying for Juice is that even the opening of the UI, uh, for example, Premiere, it calls that on the audio thread for some reason. <laughs> um, so that's really tough to deal with, right? Because opening a UI, you can't definitely not do on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the UI, th uh, on the audio thread. So you kind of have to defer that call, and that runs in all, all sorts of issues when you start resizing the window. And, and then there are some problems with the ownership of some things. I said before that you know, you're not allowed to allocate something, and then the host deallocates it. And that was an issue with this get speaker arrangement where you basically allocate your speaker range, and if you have too many speakers, um, then you have to allocate it. The plugin has to somehow allocate it. And then some of the hosts deallocated it. That led to crashes. Uh, they, I think VS, uh, Steinberg tried to fix it in 2.3, but so many hosts were already broken, and so many plugins were already blow, bro broken, that I think Juice just leaks memory here. I think that's the only way to actually get it to run in all of the hosts correctly. Um, so here's a nice little feature matrix of VST2. Uh, processing, single precision, double precision. Uh, parameters are not sample accurate. They're not time stamped. You, you can't have any non-continuous types. Uh, there's some support like for channel layouts, like surround formats. Um, bus support is limited. You can, uh, uh, a plugin can have buses, but it's really hard to change the buses. Like if you want to add a bus or remove a bus or, or, or just change the layout of a single bus, that's, you can't really do that very well in VST2. Um, the types of plugins you can make with VST2 are audio effects and instruments, and people misuse VST2 to create MIDI effects. It happens to work. Um, and the platforms it runs on is Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. And yeah, so we have this opcode invocation, and there's no real uh, validator app for VST2. So just a conclusion, VST2 was absolutely revolutionary for, for its time. I think we would all agree. It's been an incredible success, right? It has many limitations. It's just a child of its time. I mean, sure. Uh, and it's deprecated now, right? Uh, I think it's really, really good that Steinberg kind of made this cut and said, we need to move on from VST2. Don't use it anymore. So that's my conclusion. Nice to, to look inside the internals of it, but, but don't use it anymore. OK, let's go to the next one. Any questions for VST2, by the way? I said this was an interactive talk, and it's not interactive at all. Um, so, any questions for VST2? Should, should we still use it just because all the doors support it? So the question was, should you still use it because all the DAWs still support it? And maybe I'll defer that question to VST3, because VST3 has some nice features, which I think will answer that question. Anything else? OK, so let's go to audio units. I'm a huge fan of audio units because this was my first computer where I learned programming, um, a Mac 2 SI, whoa. Um, and uh, that was released in 1991, the same year QuickTime was released. And QuickTime had something called the Component Manager. So the Component Manager was used by QuickTime internally to sort of like you know, do the codecs and the sound output and the video output. And that's where, I don't know if people, how familiar people are with audio unit co uh, um, programming, but you have these like, these little um, triplets, you know, of the manufacturer, the subtype, uh, and, the, uh, and um, the type of your audio unit. Um, so that all comes from that component manager. Also, uh, audio units need to have a thing resource. Like up until, I don't know, 10.6, Mac OS 10.6, you need to have that weird thing resource in your resource work. That's all like legacy from 1991. I mean, you know, 1991 was system six. I mean, this is 1999, which is like system seven. Um, that's, that's how Mac OS looked like, right? And that's when I started playing around with like writing some of these component manager components. And that's when Apple sort of started releasing some stuff on how to write an effect component in the component manager. Um, it, it was called the sound manager. I'm not really sure. I mean, the, the term sound manager sort of came around 1999, but it must have been there earlier already in QuickTime. Um, and it, if you look at like this documentation that I found uh, yesterday when I was looking at the Wayback Machine, it already has like some structures of audio units. And so I'm sure, and maybe some Apple person can tell me in the room, I mean, officially audio units were launched 2001 with Mac OS X, but I'm definitely sure that internally they must have been used much earlier. Um, but I don't know. Um, Apple is a bit secretive about that sort of stuff. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, 2001, that's uh, six years after VST2 was released. So uh, yeah, the overview, the basic structure of an audio unit, um, they're kind of divided into scopes. You have an input scope and an output scope and a global scope, and each scope can have elements. Now, the global scope can only have one element, that's like the zero element, and then the input scope, the elements there are basically your buses. So you can have uh, any number of buses on the input side, any number of buses on the output side. Um, all of these buses, you know, they can have stream formats, and each stream format has channels, and, um, and there's a, a really nice property system. So all of these elements, they can have properties, uh, which are specified by property IDs. And like the global scope has some like, global properties like bypass, uh, but then every element, for example, has a name property. Um, the bus elements could have like a format property or a number of channel properties. And we ref you refer to these properties sort of with a path. You say like, which scope? I want the input scope. I want bus one. And then I want the property format. That's kind of a thing that's used everywhere in, in, in audio units. And it's kind of nice because you can listen to all these properties. So with VST2, the only thing you could kind of listen for were parameter changes. But with these properties, you can basically listen for the bypass changing or the latency changing. And the host can listen to it, but also the plugins can listen to it. And it's sort of a nice, nice concept. Um, the uh, rendering of audio units is a bit different to VSTs. So they use a pull model. So imagine uh, you're creating this audio unit here. You would get a render callback, right? And in your render callback, you are responsible for getting the input audio from the audio unit that's connected to you. So as an audio unit, you sort of have to query who's connected to my input port and then actually call the render block of the audio unit um, that's, that's behind you, right? Uh, and like if you're an audio unit with multiple buses, then you're gonna have to call the render callback of the audio units connected to your buses. And you might think like, why, why was that done that way? Well, it allows you to do some nice stuff. Imagine this audio unit, right? This, uh, this audio unit wants 128 samples from this audio unit. Now this audio unit can say, hey, I'm only gonna take 64 samples of this guy and time stretch it. Or uh, this thing might be actually a compressed format. So I'm gonna only take a few bytes from this audio unit, decompress it, and send it back. Right, that's something you could never do uh, with, uh, with VST. Right, with VST, you always get a fixed block size. There's no way to like, kind of ask the input for, for a smaller chunk of blocks. So it kind of allows you to do uh, uh, converters, codecs, time stretching, those kind of things. Now, under the hood, it also uses an opcode model. They call it selectors, not opcodes, but it's just the same ugliness, right? It's a huge switch statements of thousands and thousands, well, not thousands, um, tens. <laughs> uh, I, I counted it, I think it's like 70 or something, so uh, select statements um, to, to, to invoke, invoke your functions. So we have this nice little funnel here again. Instead of um, the VST SDK, we have the core audio utility classes, which kind of help you in this funneling job. Um, but you know, it, it, to, just to, 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 think, to, to get the, to, um, to really emphasize this, you know, both all of the plugins and both all of the hosts have to have a copy of this core audio utility class in their code. It's not just a header, right? These are CPP files you need to include into your code to basically do this uh, to, to, to pass through this little hole here. Uh, parameters are, are, they've learned from VST2, right? Um, they're identified by an integer ID, not their index anymore, yay, so we don't have that reordering problem. They can have names, labels, and units. Uh, they can also be Boolean and, and contiguous and non-contiguous, so they're also an improvement to VST2. Um, they can be even marked as linear and logarithmic. Uh, and parameters can be timestamped and scheduled. That's, that's very important. And you can explicitly mark dependen uh, um, dependencies between parameters. So that's kind of important to get around that loop of death I, I showed you before. Quickly, how do parameters work? In, in audio units, you have a set parameter and get parameter call, just like VST2, but you also have this scheduled parameter call where you, pace, uh, you pass a number of events to the plugin and say, hey, I want this parameter change to happen then. And these parameter changes can be immediate or they can be ramped. If they're ramped, it's like a linear change, so it's really sample accurate, right? And you know, that's really, really nice because when they're ramped, your plugin knows that they're ramped. It's going from this value to this value, so you could you know, change your DSP to reflect that. You, you might already have a linear inter interpolator in your, in your DSP, so you can make use of that. 
Um, the qu quickly mentioned the core audio utility classes. It's 60,000 lines of codes, um, but it, it's, it's very, very nicely built. Um, for example, for multi-mono plugins, they have this concept of a kernel. So your audio unit is this big thing, but uh, each, because it's multi-mono, basically each channel just has the same processing. So the core audio utility classes introduce this concept of a kernel, which just does the DSP on a single channel, and then uh, the core audio utility classes will manage the number of kernels for you. So if the host all of a sudden wants four channels, it will just duplicate the number of kernels and do that, all that kind of maintenance for you. It also can slice the render callback to align with the scheduled, scheduled parameter changes, right? If you would have to deal with this uh, event thing here and like, you know, put them in a queue and schedule them correctly, that could be quite difficult. So the core audio utility classes, they will just slice your render callback into smaller slices to align with when the parameter changes actually happen. Uh, future proofing, I, maybe I missed something, but it's not quite as good as VST2, which surprised me. There is a can-do selector from the host to the plugin, and then the host, uh, the plugin can say, yes, I support that, or I don't, but I couldn't really find the other way around in, in audio units too. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm really missing something. If I am, then please shout. Um, anyway, here's the feature matrix. A lot, a lot of green, right? So they learned from the mistakes of VST2. Uh, these parameters are all green now. Uh, they have uh, incredible bus support and uh, support for surround formats. And the reason why they have that is because um, they, uh, they offer so many more plugin types, right? So you could have a mixer type, and a mixer type needs to dynamically create buses on the fly, right? You, you add tracks and add tracks to your project. That mixer audio unit needs to have more and more buses to, to cope with that. So they have a really, really good uh, bus system. They have a validator app, AUVAL. I'm sure you've all used it. Um, but of course, the, the huge downside is it's Mac OS only. I mean, iOS, you can use AUV2s, but only if you created them and only if you're using them inside your own app, or you can use the Apple ones, but you could not like, have a plugin system, really. Like, you can only use your own AUV2s on iOS. So it, it's, really, it's really Mac OS only. Um, so conclusion, it addressed many of the shortcomings of VST. I think it's, uh, you know, AU and AUV3 is the most versatile of all the plugin formats because you can create so many different types of plugins. Um, but it has some limitations. It's still based on the op, uh, opcode dispatch. It's difficult to extend. We have this can-do thing, but it doesn't really go the other way. And yeah, I think the main one is it's, it's macOS only. So VST3, right? Uh, this is when VST3 was introduced 10 years ago, when, uh, you know, it's not that long ago that people had these unibody MacBook Pros and Android. Uh, yeah, 10 years ago, that's when it was uh, announced. The same year, VST3 was announced. And this has a dramatic change in the structure of your plugin. It has sort of two parts. It has a controller part, which does all of your business logic, and it has a processing part, and I really like to think of this processor as a black box, which is like a streaming processor. It takes, you know, you think of it like it has like an audio connection, and, and it just processes that audio like a little, uh, like a black box uh, data processor, and it processes events, so these events can come in and can come out. Um, and it does none of the business logic, right? So it's, it should be, it should really just be DSP only. Um, and the controller does all of the business logic. And what, what was really, really nice is that um, the VST3 spec really is super future-proof. So what, what they write in their spec is that um, this processor shouldn't even communicate with the controller via pointers. It should communicate with the controller via messages. And because of that, uh, technically, the processing part of your audio unit could run on a completely different processor. It could even run somewhere on the network. Uh, you know, um, I don't think any host does that right now, but the spec certainly allows for that. And you know, hearing Jules' talk, a keynote talk, uh, this suddenly becomes very, very interesting. And um, yeah, we'll talk a bit about that a bit later. Uh, the processing is still the same, it's still like this process replacing, so it doesn't, um, you know, it, it doesn't have a pool model like audio unit does. Uh, and portability, so no more opcodes. What they rely on are virtual classes again. But didn't I just say that classes are not allowed, right? At the beginning of the talk, I said you can't use classes at the interface layer. Well, you can if you follow certain rules. And these rules are you're not allowed to have a destructor. Remember the ordering issue there if you have destructors. 
you can only use uh, plain old data types, so no std string, no std array, um, and no exceptions, no operators, and there's a, a dozen of other rules. But if you follow those rules, and this is just a coincidence, this is not in the standard, for some reason, every compiler kind of generates the same B table, and they all become compatible. And I'm, 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 when I say all, I really mean like Borland C++ from 1988 will actually produce the same code. And uh, you know, Steinberg was not the first to realize this. Microsoft, you know, 1993, three years before VST1 came out, uh, realized uh, that um, you could use this as a standard, basically, to talk um, to plugins that were built by different compilers, and they called this the component object model, COM. Uh, who has heard of COM or ever dealt with COM? Wow, okay, I wasn't expecting that. Wow, okay, that is like 90% of the room. So, I don't know about you, but like every time I see COM, like it looks kind of like this. <laughs> and and I, I, I don't know what, what it is with COM, but every time I see COM, I always have to think of UML, right? And every time I see UML, I think of all the things that are wrong with this world, and then I go home and cry. <laughs> um, um, you know, COM is like, it's, I mean, com, come on, like COM was invented in 1993, VST3 was invented in 2008, right? Like so many years. Like, is someone seriously still using COM? I, okay, well, of course, Microsoft, they invented it, right? And okay, fine, they based their whole operating system around COM, right? All of .NET, all of WP, well, WP not quite COM, but very, very close to COM. They're still using COM. But I mean, okay, they invented it, right? No, nobody else in their right mind would use that. Well, except, of course, Firefox is completely built on COM. They call it XPCOM, but it's, it's just COM, and then, of course, Thunderbird. But, I mean, none of the big boys, I mean, okay, Microsoft, they invented it, but, like, none of the really serious people would use COM until you kind of start writing an uh, audio driver in Mac uh, in, in user space, and you start looking at the headers and the documentation, and there's UUIDs, and there's, like, an I unknown query interface and add ref. Yeah, so Apple in their latest operating system, they also use COM, and they use a bunch of it, right? And Google uses it in Chrome for their plugins. So all of these people are still using COM, and they still decide to use it. And the reason is it's because it's good, right? It might be ugly, but it does the job really, really well. It allows you to use C++ at the interface layer. So the next time, I know VST3 gets a lot of bad rep for using COM, but it actually, I, I think it's a really good choice, right? Um, it makes this funnel picture look like this all of a sudden. Right, there's no more tiny hole here. There's a huge, huge gap where you can use C++. And although, sure, you have to like, watch out for certain things, add ref and releasing, you could write your plugin completely without these SDKs, just by including headers. And, and that's something, I think. Like, Juice does this, right? Um, Juice just uses the plugin interface headers um, to communicate with the host. And that's really, really nice. You can still use the VST3 utility classes if you want to, right? Com is not easy to deal with, I give you that. Um, so um, if you want to write something down at this level, uh, yeah, you can, can use those utility classes. Okay, so uh, parameters, uh, yay, they're identified by an integer ID now, they're continuous, non-continuous, they can be scheduled and ramped, just like audio units, they caught up there. Um, and really, really nice about this parameter system is now that the controller, when you change a parameter or the host changes a parameter, it always goes via the host into this event system and then to the processor. This makes this uh, parameter spiral of death really, really hard to get into because the, 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 uh, the, the, the parameters that your processor is getting is always coming from the host, always coming via this event stream. That's a really, really clean method of doing that. And uh, the VST3 SDK, quick word on that, uh, has a, a GUI library that you can use. So if you want to cross-plot from UI, you can do that. And uh, to your question, um, is that the uh, VST3 has this like once and export to many other formats. So you can write a VST3 and actually export your plugin to VST2 or to audio units or to AAX even. So that's pretty cool. Um, extensibility, well, that's kind of built into COM. I'm not going to go much into this. I'm kind of running out of time. Um, uh, and the feature matrix, well, it has, it's getting a lot, lot, lot greener. It's not quite as flexible as audio units. Uh, but yeah, it runs on all the platforms. You have a nice little COM interface, a validator app. You can even run it on iOS you know, with this audio unit v3 exporter that I just showed. So yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty nice. Address many of the shortcomings. Uh, yeah, wrapper code and just what I mentioned, it's not quite as versatile as audio units. So there's like no, you couldn't really write a mixer VST um, with VST3. 
Okay, so AAX, now this is the part where I'm gonna get sued. Um, first of all, this is probably not the AAX logo. Secondly, if you look on uh, Wikipedia, this is all public knowledge. Um, uh, if, if you're a developer and you have signed uh, the AAX SDK, then you've signed a non-disclosure agreement, so you're not allowed to talk about AAX. Um, so this is, of course, all public knowledge, what I'm telling you. Um, first of all, the history, um, RTAS and TDM were already existing plugins uh, uh, with Pro Tools. I'm not exactly sure when they were released. This is the best I could find, um, I, but I don't think this is actually correct. Uh, and uh, then, they, then AX was introduced in 2011 with Pro Tools 10, but they already had a, a lot, a lot of experience with, with plugins before that. So quick, really high level overview of AX because I can't go into the details because I'm afraid I'll be sued. Uh, but this is a, a super, super high level uh, overview. I'm not gonna go into many of the details, but because uh, plugins and Pro Tools could always run on external hardware, they had the separation of the processor and the business logic baked into it uh, very, very deeply. Um, they have kind of, to share data, it's a bit cumbersome in AX. You have this kind of shared struct where the processor can access directly, but the controller can only access the struct sort of with an API describing the struct and changing things in the struct. I, um, like I said, I don't wanna go into too much detail on that. Um, the uh, processing model is also a, pre a replacing model, so you get your buffer from the host and you need to fill it. Uh, it also uses COM under the hood, just like VSD3, except for some reason when it doesn't which is really strange. And I, I, I've always wanted to, I've asked it on the, on, the, on, the pro, on the AX forum why that is, but for some reason, uh, the string class has a destructor, so that means you actually can't build your plugins um, with Clang or GCC on Windows. They'll just crash then in Pro Tools. So they kind of use COM to make your thing portable, but then it isn't. Um, I'm not sure if that was an oversight, uh, not, not quite sure. Anyways, uh, parameters, very similar. They're identified by strings instead of uh, IDs, but they have all the, the features you want. They have even many other cool features like gain reduction meters and AQ curves that you can uh, tell the host about. Uh, this is the, their, their, uh, their, their matrix here. I mean, obviously, the, it only runs on Pro Tools, so no Linux and iOS. Okay, then audio unit V3. Um, I'm gonna really briefly touch on this. Definitely not their official logo, so now Apple is gonna sue me as well. Um, I, I couldn't find a logo for Audio Unit V3, but it probably doesn't exist. Uh, was introduced, hey, the first year of ADC. So when we launched ADC, it was the same year when uh, Audio Unit V3 was introduced. And it has this, really the same structure of our AUV2. Uh, and that is because it's backward compatible. So AUV2 hosts can load AUV3 plugins. Uh, so they, have, they, they need to have the same structure under the hood. But um, uh, it's basically a, an objectify, an objective C-ified version of AUV2. So instead of dealing with this cumbersome opcode uh, interface, you can now use Objective uh, Objective C. Um, so we don't have that funnel of portability anymore. There's no utility classes for AUV3 because the interface is so nice; you can just use it directly. Um, then you know some of these uh, AUV2 uh, concepts really map extremely nicely to Objective C. With AUV2, I said like everything's done with properties, um, so you have uh, in Objective C you have key value observers, um, so you can use that for the properties. Um, you can't really use Objective C for real-time program pro processing, right? It's uh, it's, it's not real-time safe, but you can register like your callback function with Objective C lambdas and then call into C++. It, it actually fits really really nicely. They've also completely revised the way you do UI, so that's new, and that's really, really good because uh, UI code is really ugly in a a AUV2. Um, they have um, sandboxing AUV3s as part of the API, right? I mean, you can sandbox VST, VST2s and VST3s, but you kind of, like, that's not, that's not part of the spec. But here, sandboxing AUV3s is actually baked into the API, so that, that's really nice. And they have some nice additions to parameters as well. So this is the feature matrix, uh, same as AUV2 really, uh, except here we have an Objective C now, no more opcode, and we've iOS is green now because yeah, AUV3s are, are supported on iOS. Okay, so those were the plugin formats. Uh, the future. Now, when I 
uh, prepared this part of the talk. This was actually a long time ago because I wanted to talk about this part of the talk potentially at last year's ADC. I decided not to. Uh, and that was before Seoul was announced or when it was even in the works. And well, my idea was, first of all, I really like this uh, splitting up this thing into a controller and a processor part, right? I think this is uh, what VST3 does in AAX really, really makes sense because you can sandbox this nicely. You can let this maybe run in the kernel. You can let it maybe run completely somewhere else. I think uh, Jules mentioned a lot about this in, in his talk. And already when I spoke to many ADC uh, attendees, many people actually already do something very, very similar. They have their DSP code in a processor. And what they do is they, they compile this to LLVM bytecode and then when you install your plugin on your machine, that's when the LLVM, LLVM bytecode actually gets compiled onto a DLL. And that's really nice because then your, your, your plugin's uh, DSP code is you know, optimized exactly for your customer's CPU. So you know, if, you're, if your customer has AVX2 or AVX512, um, doing it this way uh, will give you the, you know, the fastest kind of processing you can get. And if some people at my workshop yesterday told me that this is pretty much exactly what they do. Um, so people are already kind of doing this. So what my proposal was, was to say, hey, well, why don't we say this is now what the plugin is, and we take this LLVM bytecode, and we distribute the bit code instead of distributing the DLL. So the, the business logic will still be exported as a DLL. Um, the processing part, will be distributed as bit code, and now the host can go ahead and compile that for you when you're using your plugin. And the reason why that is nice is, uh, if you remember this here, right, remember all these problems we had by sample by sample processing, by just taking it out and putting it into your DLL. We had problems with you know, accurate sample parameters. Um, all of this can be worked around by doing it this way, because now all of a sudden, you know, the host can inline this part of the code, and it can compile all of this on the fly. But um, I'm no longer working at Roly, right? So I'm not influenced by them. Uh, but you know, I kind of think, you know, Seoul kind of took this, took that, uh, took the spotlight from that idea because I think that's just, you know, Seoul is even a better idea. And uh, yeah, so let's see what happens with this. Okay. So uh, any questions? I have minus I have half a minute for questions. I think. <laughs> Really nice talk. Any question? Yeah. Uh, I believe that uh, Ableton Live still doesn't support VST3. Uh, Maybe some other DAWs. So that would be a reason to. I mean, you have the, the, these plug. I mean, VST3 has these exporters, so you could write your plugin in VST3 and export it as VST2. Um, but um, I think it's in the works. I don't know. Probably the crowd knows more than me. Ableton Live, I think, does it support VST3 now, or will it? No. Ivan, do you know? Is Ivan Grabitz still here, or have I? Oh, he's there. Oh, there he is, yeah. Do you want to comment on it, maybe, Ivan? Or is there any? I think they are working on it. They're working on it, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Any, any other questions? I'm not sure if there's still time, but. Uh, yeah, Richard in the front. So this, is, this is more a question for, about, about Juice. You know, mm. Does Juice actually magic all this away and you don't need to know about it uh, that much? I'd, I'd say 90% of it. Um, I don't know, it's a question for the audience, right? I mean, I think, um, so I mean, it, 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 it magically puts it away on the coding side, but then the behavior of your plugin will still be different. And then you're probably going to have a lot of workarounds in your, you know, even though know, you're using Juice, you only have to write it once, that's true. But if you're doing anything more complex, you're probably going to have some if statements in your plugin, like saying, hey, if I'm loaded as a VST3, then do this slightly different. If I'm loaded as a VST2, do this slightly different. But I think it gets 90% of the way. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, thank you for a great present, presentation. And what about offline processing, like for instance a reverse or those right. kinds of processing where actually you need to get information 
from the future or from the past? From the past is easy, but from the future? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think VST3 supports it, right, Ivan? <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure how far into the future. I mean, they're, they're, I, maybe you would want to use a different uh, plugin format then. Um, I mean, uh, RD units, uh, well, I mean, they only have these like offline flags. So, you know, really to say, to really take future samples far ahead in the future, which are, um, I don't think you could do with any of the plugin formats, I believe. Um, I'm not sure, actually. Good, good question. Yeah. AX supports it with Audio Suite. Okay, yeah, with Audio Suite they support it, yes. But that's that's a different plugin format then, right? So, and I think there's VST modules as well, um, which may or not, may not support that. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, you probably have to use a different plugin format actually to do that. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, the, the ARA extension might be something that could solve that. Yes, that's true. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, ARA. I don't know what that stands for. But. Uh, arbitrary, right? Uh, no, yeah, yeah. Random access. Audio random access. Audio random access, yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Well, then, uh, thank you for coming. Thanks.